What do I need to be good at? To be great at something. Hello, everyone. You are listening to She Leads with Carly. And in this show, we talk to the absolute best, brightest, and yes, badass leaders. Tap into where your natural curiosity takes you. Just making sure you're not your own roadblock. Even if you do fall, you're going to fall and you're going to learn. Together, let's build a DNA of what it takes to rise to the top and truly make an impact. I'm your host, Carly Malatsky. Hello, everyone. I am super excited to welcome our guest today, Lauren Burson. Lauren is an executive turned entrepreneur with 18 plus years of experience building brands, products, and communities across a diverse set of industries. Lauren is the founder and CEO of Conceive, a digital health platform aiming to change fertility and pregnancy outcomes and experiences through community, evidence-based education, and coaching. Her focus on this problem and intention behind the company is actually deeply personal. She welcomed her daughter into the world after three challenging years filled with heartbreak, misinformation, and failed treatment. And Conceive is is the solution she wished she had. Conceive was also recently named one of Fast Company's most innovative companies in 2023. Prior to Conceive, Lauren was VP, Global Head of Strategy, and M&A at Weight Watchers. She was also a senior partner at Andreessen Horowitz and strategic product partnerships lead at Google. Lauren began her professional career at Citibank, starting in marketing and after five years, becoming the VP of business development. Lauren is also an active angel investor and advisor, and she also serves as a board member for the JCCA, a child welfare agency in New York City. Lauren received her bachelor's from Cornell University in policy analysis and management. Lauren, It is so great to have you on the show. Welcome. I'm thrilled to be here, Carly. Of course. So Lauren, get us started and just set the scene. Where are you in the world? What's the work situation like? How how are things? Things are good. I live out in East Hampton, New York, full-time, which is a bit of a strange place to be full-time. Most people just come here in summer. So I call all of my friends from the city tourists when they get here on the weekends in the summer. But we moved out here... Not unlike others, during the pandemic, we were in a small two-bedroom in Manhattan. Our daughter was about six months old when the pandemic hit. We all had COVID for like, I had it for eight weeks. It was scary. We needed space. We wanted nature. And we came out here temporarily and we haven't left. So it will be our third year. And it's a lovely place to be. It's a little isolating in the winter time, but we get a lot of city time to kind of keep that energy up. And since I started Conceive, While out here, we are technically a fully remote company, but it just so happens a lot of my team is in the city. So I get to spend a lot of quality time with them, uh, you know, a couple times a month. Amazing. And so Lauren, as you know, I love to start the show going all the way back to your childhood. Tell me a little bit about five-year-old Lauren, 10-year-old Lauren. I know you grew up in Queens. And so, yeah, tell me about that experience. What type of kid were you? Yeah, I love how far back you go. And I love how like you added to my bio about what I majored in because I'm like, I don't even remember that. Uh, It's so great. It's so thorough. So I was reflecting on this and even talking to my family about what they remember. And it's interesting to see what they remember versus what I remember and what conflicts and what's the same. But as a kid, I was always really independent. That was like a theme that came out both for me and from others. Like I was a self-starter, and I really liked to do my own thing. I was pretty headstrong. I knew what I wanted. I was fairly good at negotiating, which is uh, a quality I see in my daughter now, even as just nearly a four-year-old. She is eerily good at trying to get what she wants, and I think that was a theme for me as well. Uh, I loved people. I've always been really extroverted in that sense that I get energy from being around people, and I always enjoyed fostering kind of like deep, meaningful friendships versus more surface level. Um, I enjoyed a lot of things. I tried theater, you know, I was Snow White and Ariel the Little Mermaid and like plays that never mattered, but I enjoyed it. Um, I loved camp and sports. I was never particularly good at sports. I, you can't tell, but I'm only five foot one. Uh, And I tried to play basketball 
And I have a sad story in elementary school where I tried out for our basketball team in the fourth grade and I didn't quite make it, but they let me be a scorekeeper. And he said, my coach said, like, Lauren, if people are sick, you can you can get in. And I was like, great. One day, like everyone was sick, Carly, like everyone, no one was there. And I was like, coach, put me in, coach, put me in. And he was like, no. No. It was a very sad, it was a very sad moment. I was convinced he was pretty short. So I was convinced that he was like trying to like, you know, punish me for, for things that he was punished for too. <laughs> Who knows? No, I, I don't <laughs> like that story. So I want to know, um, one thing we talked about even before is your parents, your dad was in construction and your mom was a public school teacher. So you were exposed to these type of roles and I'm curious, how were you thinking? Like, what did you want to be when you grew up? Was it, you know, your, did you even know about what a founder was? Did you know what tech was? How were you exposed to computers? Things like that. Yeah. So my parents, yeah. In more traditional industries, right. Growing up in Queens, uh, the beauty of what my dad did though, he owned a company with his father, uh, in construction and they, you know, dating back to, I think his grandfather, they helped build landmark, uh, buildings like Grand Central Terminal, and then it flipped into kind of more high-end stores on Fifth Avenue, focusing on like the glass and the metalware. And what doesn't sound intuitive, but what happened was he always needed to bring home a computer uh, so that he could do stuff at home. And I, right. you know, obviously got the benefits of that, both me and my brother. And we would play all sorts of games from a very young age, like games that were totally kid-friendly and games like Leisure Suit Larry that were totally inappropriate for me to be playing. And I'm definitely dating myself. I don't expect you to know what I'm talking about. But, <laughs> but so I was immersed in computers and technology from that perspective. But again, you know, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. And so the traditional industries were what was sort of at my fingertips or what I understood. Like I knew about tech, but I didn't know you could like work in it. And so my mom, as a school teacher, I was like, maybe I want to be a teacher. Um, and over time, I think, and maybe this was more of like the world convincing me, like there was this notion that I wanted to be a lawyer. And I think a lot of that was, again, my ability to convince people to do things that I wanted to do and bring people along and kind of like build rapport and build communities was always something I was innately good at. And I think it was something I just sort of had to do. And, um, and so that was my path. And I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. I was going to take the LSAT. And the idea was always that I would uh, kind of get some basis for law, but really just take the LSAT while I was in college and then get some experience before I actually pursued law and pursued law school. Everybody said to me, you need to take tests while you're used to taking tests. And that's when you're in college, right? Obviously afterwards, I guess people thought there was like this muscle you lose on how to take a test. Uh, and so that was what I was convinced was my path. And so I remember studying for the LSAT and taking, I think, even like a practice, the prep classes, right? And what happened was my, I'm like, what had happened was, this is like me telling myself what, why I didn't follow through, but my grandmother died. Actually, a bunch of my grandparents died. All of my grandparents died in the span of four years. It was a very weird thing. And like, I am not super woo woo, but I have to believe there was like something around heartbreak, you know, like my grandmother, who my dad's mom was a very strong woman and had been through a lot of bouts of cancer and, and different diseases. And she was diabetic and she always recovered. And then he passed away. And six months later, she passed away. Like there was some connectivity there. And there was a similar thing on my mom's side. And I just remember feeling like this is overwhelming. I don't want to take this course right now. Um, and so I dropped it and I kind of went down the path of, well, what am I going to do after school? I only knew about traditional things like working at big companies, right? Working at a bank was like a thing that, you know, I knew about. Um, and so I interviewed at Amex. I interviewed at City. I got jobs at both. Um, and I pursued the job at City. So even getting before city and choosing, you know, your next path, I feel like it's actually so incredibly common for people to go into college and understand and know that, you know, there are these traditional paths, maybe my skills align with being a doctor or a lawyer, and they just really go into that route, right? And it's, and it's uncommon to actually almost step away from it and realize, is this something I really want to do? 
And maybe, you know, you had external circumstances that maybe pushed you to do that. But what advice or, you know, insight that you learned from that experience that you can almost share with others who are like, you know what, maybe how do you determine like, this is my calling and this is what I should be doing? Yeah. Oh, that's such an interesting question, especially now, since I feel like I'm completely doing exactly what I was meant to do. And all of my kind of sort of quirky past, in hindsight, everything looks perfect, right? It all feels like it was set up to shape me. Um, Yeah. I think, you know, one thing I think a lot about is a lot of people get stuck in places. And I think a lot of career transition and like questioning is a coming from a place of, I don't want to call it weakness, but a feeling of being stuck. And you can feel stuck for a whole set of reasons. One is because you have uncertainty and you don't know exactly what you're trying to pursue. Another reason is maybe there are financial reasons, right? Like part of the reason for me getting experience first was also because I was going to have to pay for law school, like with loans and things like that. And so also trying to save up for something like that. It wasn't something my parents were able to, to pay for and they paid for college. And I'm so grateful and lucky and fortunate for that. Um, but any kind of graduate school would have been on my, um, on my dime. And I think the, the sort of the common ethos, at least for me at that time around becoming a lawyer was just around kind of my personality and the things I was good at, but I don't know that I was fascinated by the law itself. And in fact, what happened for me specifically was I saw a lot of friends who went directly to law school, like my roommate at the time. And she was like miserable. I didn't know anybody that was happy either in law school or practicing law. And I had done an internship in college as well and got exposure to the lawyers there. And so I think what I found was that like maybe my personality was aligned with like being successful in a job, but like the actual day to day didn't feel as compelling to me. And, uh, and and so I guess a couple of things in terms of like advice I would give, I think one is, you know, there are practicalities you have in life and then there are like gut feelings. And when you're lucky enough to have a gut feeling about something, um, obviously try and stack the deck so that you can pursue it. Right. And that can be really hard. Right. I, I recognize that it's someone who didn't come from privilege and didn't come from, you know, connections and relationships and lots of money. Um, I had to find my way into those things. Um, but there's something so beautiful about it. And I really have, have started to believe that ideas, right, are living things in a way. And they kind of, they come to you, but they will pass you by. And there's a couple of books I've read that have like similar concepts around this. In Killing Commendatory, uh, there's a whole concept around ideas kind of parading around as ghosts. Uh, in the book by the author of Eat, Pray, Love, and I'm totally going to forget her name. Elizabeth Gilbert, Yes, I think. she talks yeah. about it's magic something, and she talks about ideas coming to you. And then recently I read The Alchemist for the first time, and there's a different concept in that, right, of kind of like your life's journey, and, and it's also called something differently. You can see my brain is not fully functioning, but I think anyone who read these books knows what I'm talking about. And I think that you are set up so that you don't have heartbreak later if you don't pursue the idea. And so like you have to seize onto those things when you find them and when you find something you're passionate about. Now, practically, it's not always like the right time. And so I think if you can figure out how to stack the deck to find your path there, like when I was at City, for example, after a number of years, the New York tech ecosystem started to kind of burgeon, right? And the tech world at that point was like Jet Setter, was like the hot tech company, which was like a daily sale at, at, uh, at noon um, where people would go on and get discounts to some of their favorite brands that were usually pretty expensive. And it was this sort of phenomenon, right? Um, sorry, that was guilt. And then Jet Setter was the travel version of that. Um, and I was sort of fascinated with some of these startups Uh, And I wanted to work at a startup. I just knew that like culture wise and people wise and mission wise, I was more attuned for those things. Um, And so I started, you know, kind of setting myself up for that and figuring out, you know, how I could kind of parlay the skills that I had built into working at a startup, which I eventually did. First of all, I just want to touch on what you said earlier about, you know, ideas come, but it's a matter of it's just as easy for them to go right? And just go through us. And I love that concept of, you know what, trying to be in tune with 
ideas and callings that come your way. And I think personally, I think it's harder to do when you're younger and maybe it gets easier as you get older and you start to gain experience. And maybe you had that, you know, founding conceive and going through your own personal journey. But I think it's so often when you're early, you have that, at least, you know, I'm talking from personal experience, but you have that like, you know, stress and drive to be like, okay, I want to make sure I'm doing, you know, adding things to my toolkit to eventually, you know, answer my calling, if you will. And so I even want to ask you, you said, you know, at City, you had this concept and this idea that you would thrive in a startup environment and you set yourself up for that. What does that look like? What is setting yourself up for? Is it talking to people? Is it just outwardly looking for startups or how did you go about that? Yeah. And I I think that was the point I wanted to make too, which is what you just crystallized was like at the time I was like, well, I should build my own startup, but I didn't have the idea. I didn't have the resources and connections uh, to make it happen. Right. And so essentially, instead of that, what I had was a set of philosophies and like a framework for the things that were most important to me. Right. I had learned a lot being at City for seven years, which was a sort of strange place to be in the early to late 2000s, especially when shit hit the fan and we went through, you know, recession. Uh, and I, I, but what, I, what was always clear to me was what was important. And what I did was I actually just spent time talking to smart people who I respected about the things that were important to me to see if they had any ideas. Because I, again, I felt stuck candidly. You know, I was there for a long time. I was sort of growing. I was held back by a whole set of things, including my age and, and, you know, working in an environment with a lot of older white men who were there for a very long time. Right. And I think even several years in, I was really forced to lose the notion of how to express myself because it wasn't always welcome. Um, I learned the, the politics of a big company and things like that. But I also think I learned some bad habits that I had to shed over time. Like what, what were some of those habits? One of the main ones, and it was such a stark juxtaposition when I joined a startup, was just speaking my mind and sharing my perspective. I know it sounds wild, but like you had to do a lot of hemming and hawing. And I actually, you know, I was reading the other day, Adam Grant posted uh, about a series of meta analyses on how women need to um, use sort of like tentative language in order to appear likable. Right. And that actually when they do that and they say sort of and they say maybe and like things like that, they do better. Yeah. Right. And what's so interesting is I had this boss at City who was one of few younger women who was in a senior position who was incredible and was such a mentor to me in many ways. And I learned so much from her. And she was adept at using that language, the sort of the maybes. And she did not come off as a tentative person. But she came off as somebody who is very certain, but was sort of bringing people in. And I think there's sort of that aspect. But there was also sort of just not even being able to express myself, which was uh, something I had to unlearn. I remember when I joined Mebo, which is the startup I wound up at. And I'm happy to share how I, how I wound up there. My boss was like, Lauren, you know, we were talking about something. He was like, Lauren, what do you think? And I was like, well, maybe if we, you know, I was like using it and he's like, Warren, what the fuck do you think? And I was like, oh, I fucking hate it. And he was like, thanks. Yeah. And it was so refreshing. And I was almost like in total culture shock for so many reasons when I joined the tech world, not to mention when we were acquired by Google less than a year later. And I found myself on a campus where they serve lobster for lunch. Um, if I explain to you <laughs> what working in Long Island City, Queens in 2004 was like at the one building with like the one restaurant in it, it was just like a very different uh, ecosystem. So, okay, Lauren, I can go in so many different directions, but I want to ask you, even before we actually go into Mebo yeah. and how you got there, you mentioned how you almost had to untrain yourself mm -hmm. and teach yourself yeah. different aspects. Was that, do you attribute that largely to just people around you are kind of forcing you to say, Lauren, you know, speak up and be confident? Or did you have to do almost like self-reflection, self-advocacy, you know, personal journey um, that you went through? I think it was so confusing. And now with all of this sort of talk coming to the forefront around how women or girls are really taught to be people pleasers because we have to be, I've reflected a lot on these things, right. right? And so like, yes, in many ways, I definitely was raised to be a people pleaser or I just became one because it was the way that I could get attention and I got the A pluses and I followed the rules. 
And I laugh with my mom a lot about like the moments where I stopped following the rules, like in high school when I had already gotten into Cornell and she came into my room and she was like, don't you have a test to study for? And I was like, mom, I have a 99 average and I'm going to Cornell, like fuck off. Um, I don't know if you're allowed to curse on this podcast, but I, I have many times. <laughs> yep. You're all good. Uh, but, but the, the notion of, of like people pleasing, I think part of me was raised that way. And then, but I was always very headstrong and very honest about who I was and what I felt. And it was sort of beaten out of me over the course of seven years where it was clear my opinion wasn't as welcome unless I could sort of manipulate in a way that was like more underground, right? And so some of those tactics were interesting and right. some of them were not helpful. So what were what were some of those that people can use? Because I think, sadly, this is still occurring today, right? Where people are in environments where they don't feel confident. And I think, you know, Rashma Sujani did such a beautiful job on her, her commencement speech where she talked about how the notion of imposter syndrome is is sort of a trick played on women, right? Because we were never allowed to be in those rooms. So how did we ever feel comfortable and confident in those rooms, right? And I thought that was such a unique way of thinking about it um, and finding my voice and finding your voice. So I think a couple things. I think one was being immersed in environments where people were just speaking up and getting things done was so refreshing to me. And so I just you know, figured that that was, that was going to be more, a more successful route. <clears throat> In addition to taking some of the skills I learned on how to uh, really influence without authority, like that's something I just became really adept at not having managed teams that young and just sort of, or, you know, early on in my career and really being immersed in environments where I had strong opinions, but like had to learn how to bring people with me. Um, that didn't report to me, right? That didn't have to listen to me. So tell me a little bit, you found Mebo and obviously they got acquired, you know, a year later by Google. Um, and I want to know how did that whole process happen? And even more so, you come from this traditional background, right? Where you have that security and that's important. And that's, you know, one of the reasons going to city. So obviously a startup is a very stark contrast to that. So what gave you that, you know, conviction that, you know what, it's risky, but I need to be in that environment. Yeah, you know, it all goes back to to my three things, and uh, it, this this advice was given to me by a mentor at the time who I mentioned, Tara from City, because she was really helping me think through what to do next. And because I wasn't drawn to a certain industry or a certain function, and I could wear a lot of hats, it wasn't as obvious for me. And so that philosophy of three things has been something that I share with almost everyone. I talk to some of our members about it. I talk to peers. I talk to mentors. But I think that if you're thinking about a career change, it's very easy to gut feel your way through it. And your gut is usually right. So there's like things you probably won't miss. But I think what's really hard is you can very much overlook things that are important to you if you aren't very intentional about what those things are. And so I think before you start to embark on a journey, or even if you're already assessing a company that's trying to recruit you, the best thing you can do is make a list. And as you get further into your career, your list might be 10, 15, 20 things, 100 things, right? Who knows? But if you're very clear with yourself about what the most important things are, I'm talking about the non-negotiables, you will not make the wrong choice because you will assess that company right? The interview process is as much for you as it is for them based on those characteristics. And you shouldn't make the wrong choice unless someone's duping you, right? <laughs> In which case, that sucks. Um, yeah. And so that to me was what led me to Mebo and what led me to, yeah, a more risky sort of endeavor than the, you know, I don't even know how many hundreds of thousands of people City had at that time. But I was looking at the time and I still remember, I mean, and in many ways, some of these things have not changed at all, Right. I realized very early on uh, that if you don't work for somebody who is smart and is willing to have your back, right? Like you could be working on the sexiest thing in the world, but you will be miserable, yeah. right? So aligning yourself with a manager, that manager doesn't have to be the perfect mentor and they don't have to do all the things for you. But if you have a good relationship and they have your back, it's one of the most key things, right, to find. Yeah. Secondly, it was just really aligning my passion with what I was working on. Um, it's funny to say I was passionate about Mebo. I'm sure your many of your listeners may not even know what Mebo did, but I was way more passionate about that maybe than like debt protection products and credit monitoring products that we were selling to our credit card members that made a lot of money, by the way, but were not the most value added. 
And so really aligning passion. And then the third thing was um, driving revenue for a business. And I think I was able to do that at City. And I wanted to continue to like own a P&L and be able to really like drive meaningful revenue and be aligned with the business model. And then Lauren, when you look back at your career now, can you almost pinpoint a moment where you're like, you know what, I probably will start my own company one day? It started back in my city days. I, I knew it then, but as I mentioned, I didn't have any of the things that would have allowed me to do that well. I didn't have the connections. I didn't have the fi- you know the, the money to even like help seed myself. I didn't have, um, yeah, I didn't have the right relationships and I didn't have the idea. I had none of those things, but I just knew it was something I wanted to do. And after your time at Google, you obviously, like I said in the intro, you worked at Andreessen Horowitz for a good amount of time to really experience what it's like being an investor. What drove you, you know, almost to the other side? You, you took off the operating role, put on the investor hat. What was the big um, motivation behind that? You know, just like most of the things in my life, it's been driven by relationships. Uh, you know, I was not looking to get into venture capital Um, In fact, I actually remember at the time there was a colleague of mine who was considering it. And I was like, what is that? You know, tell me more about that. Explain it. What happened was I had an MBA summer intern at Google who worked with me. And we set up a series of events along with the founder of Mebo, who was at Google, Seth Sternberg, who now runs Honor, which Andreessen invested in. We set up this series of events with VCs and their portfolio companies. And it was this like overarching look at all of the APIs and 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 things that Google has for developers to grow their businesses. And so I actually just kind of fortuitously met a number of VCs during that time. One of which was my now former boss, Todd Lutwak, who ran the market development, the consumer market development function at Andreessen Horowitz. And market development, and now a lot of VCs look like this, but Andreessen really invested in a business model that supported the notion of helping, right? As everyone I'm sure who listens to your show knows, helping the portfolio companies in a whole set of ways. And the set of ways that the market development function helped with was accelerating time to market and generating really big deals. And so I formed a relationship with Todd, um, who I just adored, and we had a great rapport. And I remember he called me a couple of days before Google I.O., where we were launching three new products, Android Auto, which is now ubiquitous, right? If you have Apple, it's CarPlay. Um, And I was working with Pandora on that. I was working on Android TV, which is now YouTube TV that I was working with Netflix on like a lot of, ex- and then Android wear, right. Which I now have, nice. you know, all Apple yeah. <laughs> um, but at the time was bringing Fitbit and all these developers onto the watch. And so it was like a really exciting moment. And he was like, I want you to join my team. And I was like, I don't know what the fuck you do. Or maybe you mis- misread my resume. Like I wasn't a banker. Like what, what, what would I do at a venture capital firm? And when he explained the model to me, it just, is this really unique microcosm of a role that aligns so well with everything I was good at, right? Which was, again, building relationships and driving big deals. And it's this interesting thing because at the end of the day, I wasn't operating. So I wasn't up till 2 a.m. negotiating deals. But I was in the trenches with lots of companies helping them get their early distribution. Everyone from like Soylent doing deals with 7-Eleven and Amazon and Walmart. Um, And Soylent is still around and kicking. I just saw them at my local CVS. I was excited to see that so many years later helping Lyft with early deals on the travel side, uh, a whole gamut of things. And I got such great exposure to both innovation and what smart people were thinking about, but also like how corporations were innovating, if at all, and which ones were, right? So we would host Fortune 500 executives, um, C-suite, understand what they were focused on, kind of match make with our portfolio. And then because we could kind of do make it our own, I went really deep with some of them. Wow. I I love that because it very much stays true to what you've said, right? With how are you evaluating almost that next move, whether it's the people or even driving revenue. Instead of one company, you're actually able to add that expertise across many different companies, which is amazing. Exactly. And now, you know, looking back with this founder hat on, how do you, do you actually see the benefits and that the value add that you got from your time at A16Z that you've implemented as a founder? And if so, yeah, what are those? A hundred percent. I think, you know, 
Now, as a solo female founder building in digital health slash women's health, so fertility is not a women's health issue, but we are thought of as a women's health company. We can talk about that. Yeah. Um, I'll, get, I'll get back on my soapbox soon. But um, there's a lot of things writing against me, right? For sure. Now, obviously, I came from a place of privilege in that I had a lot of relationships um, in the tech world, in the venture world that did help me on my path. And I think having seen everything from the way folks did it at Andreessen Horowitz, it was a great opportunity for me to really be thoughtful about the partners that I brought onto my cap table when I was raising my first round of funding. I, I got to see all the sides um, and I got to learn from it, you know, obviously an exceptional team of folks at Andreessen Horowitz. I can't speak to the team now. It's grown so much, but so yeah. many of the folks that I worked with are still there. Um, and they just had an exceptional way of treating founders, um, which is not the way of all, right. <laughs> all venture funds. Definitely. Yeah. And you mentioned, yeah. Lauren, even throughout your career, the importance of building those relationships, right? And people say networking, which has this you know negative connotation maybe, yeah. but it's this concept of really just building great relationships with people. And when you think of your approach, do you have any almost, I don't know if I want to say secrets, but unique ways, if you will, of like, this is a really good way of building relationships and being very intentional with it. How do you go about that? I honestly, and maybe this is my secret, but I just freaking love people. And one of my dear friends who I met at Mebo, uh, Vera Saneva, who is now a COO at an amazing um, company in the Web3 space, she uh, is brilliant. And so I admire everything she says. And so I take it very highly when she says something to me, but she told me like, Lauren, you see the best in people. And that surprised me because I, as much as I do think I'm an optimist, I'm also pretty practical, but I think she was right. And when she, she said that to me, it really struck a chord, but I just love people. And I'm super curious. Um, I love to learn from every interaction I have. I see, uh, interactions like to me there's no bad interaction right like right. there's no nothing that's like wasting my time i mean obviously there's there's wastes of time but like an opportunity to meet someone and hear their perspective to me is just fascinating yeah and so that's always the way i've approached it i just really enjoy it i get a lot of energy from it and i always think about um you know i i record things about people so that i remember right yeah. it's not cuz you can tell my memory isn't as great as it used to be <laughs> my my later years um, I think that's probably my secret and I understand what they're motivated by. It's just something I can naturally seek out. And that was partly, you know, I think innate in me, but also learning over time in the kinds of roles that I've been in on the partnerships, business development side. Um, if you understand what people are motivated by, you can really connect with them in a meaningful way. Yeah. I love that. And I think, I think honestly, a huge learning from that alone is just leading with authenticity, right? And having this genuine passion. And I think it it actually becomes clear, even as an investor, right? You know, talking to founders, it's pretty clear when there's not that genuine passion or curiosity yeah. for what you're building. So anyway, I think that's super fascinating. Just on that note, Carly, friends and I, um, I'm going to steal this and she may be mad at me for, for saying it on air, but um, my dear friend, Lexi Komisar and her husband, John Curlin, who I think the world of, they recently came up with an acronym for, for people, for like friendships that they really found they seek out that I think is so resonant. And it's, it's one of the things you said. So the acronym is JAR. The first is JOY. Like people who approach life with joyfulness, right? Who have that energy. And sometimes it's something you can't define, but you're just like, ooh, yes, I want to be around that person. The yeah. second is authenticity, which is what you just said, right? And the third is range, right? And I think if you have two out of three, you're crushing it. Obviously, if you're the triple threat, it's even better. Um, but I think those are the kinds of people I'm fascinated by. Yeah, totally. Okay, so Lauren, you end up going back to an operating role at a you know top yeah. Fortune 500 company in Weight Watchers. Tell me about that experience. And also, was there ever this feeling of, shit, can I do this? You know, like, do I, do I want to go back to an operating role? How are you thinking of that, that transition? Yeah, it was so unique because I think when I got to Andreessen or when I took the role, like the expectation from my perspective was that I would go to one of our portfolio companies. And that's what a lot of people tended to do. 
But unfortunately, it was sort of like I had knew too much about them. Like it was sort of like you want to be dating someone when you start, when right. you work there, you don't want to be married. And I feel like I knew too much and every company's got its quirks. Right. And it was a really interesting time in consumer, which is sort of the area I've always really focused on. Um, I did a lot with bringing kind of CMOs together with um, companies that could help them that were SaaS companies. But I was always fascinated more by consumer. And it was sort of this quirky time in 2017 where the biggest consumer companies were like Lyft and Uber and Airbnb. Um, there wasn't a lot of sort of like burgeoning in consumer. There was this almost notion that like social is dead other than Facebook and like no one else can come into the space. And so it was just this very kind of strange time. And so I was fortunate enough at this point in my life um, to be able to actually take a break and sort of be intentional about what I wanted to do. And so I moved back to New York with Andreessen. I moved back and then I left and I didn't know what was going on in New York. I had been away for almost five years. And so it was really just like an opportunity for me to like talk to smart people because to your point, I didn't know if I wanted to stay in venture okay. or if I wanted to go back to operating. And so what I did was I just asked people, again, my tactic has been always pretty simple. Like, who is smart? Who do you like? Whether they had a role for me or not, whether their company sounded interesting to me or not. And I met with them. And through a series of, you know, of discussions, I was interviewing at some venture funds for investor opportunities. And I was also interviewing at some consumer companies. And the Weight Watchers opportunity came my way. At first, I was like, no, <laughs> this doesn't, you know, I it didn't, I didn't feel a connection. Yeah. And then, and then I was just immediately wooed the more I learned about the company. I mean, for me at that point, I had seen this proliferation of wellness companies that were all point solutions, right? So if you know how to take care of yourself, you can find like your sleep app or your yoga app or your meditation app or your activity app. Um, but no one was bringing these pieces together. And by the way, how you eat affects how you sleep, affects how you move. And Weight Watchers was in this really interesting place where they were rebranding to be an overarching wellness company, moving away from just weight loss. And they brought me on to help. And I helped launch our sleep, fitness, and meditation products, which not only extended the value prop of the company, but it extended the lifetime value of the customer, wow, which yeah. is really compelling. But the second thing I was so drawn to the company by was their community. So you've now heard my whole life, I've been building communities, yeah. right? Meeting people, connecting the dots, building rapport, all of those things. I had never done that digitally. This was always like this analog offline world where we would meet in person and we would go from there. When I saw Weight Watchers Digital Community, I was just astounded. It is still to this day, one of the most positive places on the internet. It is this microcosm of support where people are kind of, pouring their hearts out and being very vulnerable about something that is still stigmatized in this country. And everyone's in their corner cheering them on. It's just this like beautiful, palpable, contagious thing. And I wanted to learn how to do that. Like, how do you, I was fascinated with the notion of how you create safe spaces for people who, you know, don't have an outlet in other places, um, especially on the internet that I had never seen. I had seen the negativity and the trolls. And so that was really a big, um, game changer for me. Tell me, during this time, was this when you started, you wanted to have kids and you were trying to have kids and then you went through your own journey of, you know, hardship and frustration? Tell me a bit about through that process and then why you ultimately were like, you know what, there has to be a solution. And because of that, I need to be the one to do it. Yeah. I had already, we had already started trying to get pregnant when I was at Andreessen. Okay. Um, and it was this really frustrating time. And candidly, I mean, my husband and I were on different coasts part of the time. We weren't even married for all of it, but we, we were, you know, we weren't even on the same place in many, many times, but I saw doctors on the West coast. I saw doctors on the East coast. We moved back here. I joined Weight Watchers after we had a miscarriage. So it had already been like a year and a half in, we finally got pregnant. We had our miscarriage after hearing his heartbeat. Um, at about nine and a half weeks, which, you know, still brings me to a really difficult place. And it was so isolating, so devastating, so confusing. I remember before that, as I was job hunting, talking to people about, well, I'm pregnant. Like, what do I do? How do I accept a job? You know, can I tell them? When do I tell them? And right. then I lost, you know, the baby. And so 
when I finally joined Weight Watchers, we were still going through that journey um, and wound up getting pregnant relatively early on to my time there, which was also really scary because I was worried about people would think I was just there for maternity leave or something like that when I was really there to make an impact on the business. Yeah. Um, and so I was really fearful um, to talk about it openly until I also knew that it was going to be a real pregnancy because I'd already had a loss. There was just a lot of sort of shame, fear around that. And what I realized as I was going through the journey was that actually like the Weight Watchers model was kind of needed in fertility. And in many ways, you know, kind of conceive was born out of that concept. Wow. I recognized kind of early on that the two main pain points that I felt were completely, there were no solutions for, were isolation, stigma, and shame, feeling like you're completely alone in this journey. Yep. And this need to kind of form these underground networks of people who are suffering in silence. When in reality, the moment I started talking about what was going on, it was like the floodgates opened. I heard from friends and strangers and truly people I hadn't spoken to in decades, like old camp friends reaching out and saying, your story sounds like mine. Can we talk about this? And again, what happens is we're forced to form these underground networks of people who are suffering in silence when we just need support. Wow. And then the second piece was really the education. And I think on the weight loss side, it's a whole different set of things that you need to learn. Um, when it comes to education and fertility, it's really about that care navigation and the patient journey. I mapped out the patient journey and realized like, shit, this is really complicated, right? The average patient sees three to five specialists. You're doing multiple tests and treatments. There are these new add-ons and supplements and lifestyle factors. And your head is spinning from all the information. And by the way, when you Google stuff, which is usually how people find out about things, you can easily get 20 different answers to the same question. Yeah. And no resource feels trustworthy. And I realized that even when you have the means to find a great specialist, and there are only 1,300 REIs in the country, and that's a fertility specialist, so someone who on top of becoming an OBGYN, they then study an additional three years in fertility. So OBs are not fertility experts, but REIs are, reproductive endocrinologists. Uh, and and you, you don't have them in your pocket, right? Like you can call them and you'll play phone tag and they will do their best. And there are incredible doctors and nurses in this industry. But there is so much on the mental side that goes uncared for. And in fact, you know, the best REIs know that this is as much a medical journey as it is a mental health journey and mental health strain, anxiety and depression can reach that of cancer patients for many people going through this. Were you then working on this on the side while at Weight Watchers and you were like, okay, I have to explore this or, or how did you navigate that? I wasn't. I was obsessed with the space though. Like I started making a market map. I started doing research. I started kind of cold calling people uh, who worked in the industry. I found this one person as I was doing my research named David Sable, who to this day is still a friend and mentor of mine in the space. And he was like the only venture investor who only focused on IVF and fertility. And I was like, who is this person? And he was gracious enough to like bring me into his office. I think we had a 30 minute meeting scheduled and we met for like an hour and a half. And I was just sort of assembling the pieces because I was trying to look for something that would serve my needs, um, but then also do the research to understand if my needs were the needs of others, right? Like I was just one person. Like right. what really are the problem spaces here that need to be solved? Um, I, I just started by research and I started by talking to a lot of other people, right? Through the course of my own journey, I met with a lot of people and then I started interviewing them and understanding what their experiences were. And then I naturally started interviewing doctors, right? And it just it right. kind of proliferated from there. But I really started the company in earnest after I left Weight Watchers. And then, Lauren, not to almost have you relive this, if you will, right? But what did you do to get through this challenging time that so many people face? And again, it was so isolating, right? You didn't know so many women face this. And there are almost – there's a lot of aspects at play here. You mentioned the one of just – the pure heartbreak of having a miscarriage after hearing a heartbeat, right? And just going through that alone. The other aspect is even being a woman driven with a career and how to navigate that. So how were you, you know, coming back from work at home? How, how did you really get through that time where it's like, you know, how, how, how do you see the light at the end yeah. of the tunnel, if you will? 
it was hard. <laughs> it was a dark time. I'll be honest with you, you know, and I credit my husband with being like an incredible supporter and not, he didn't always know exactly how to support me. And I think like we've learned languages for how to explain how we need to be supported in those moments. And I think this is something that goes beyond just your partner if you have one. But I think, you know, if you're going through distress, a great response from someone you love is like, what would you, how would you like me to support you right now? Do you want me to try and problem solve? Do you want me to just give you a hug and tell you I'm here and that you are, your feelings are valid? And so we went through kind of like those motions. But I, you know, I think, uh, it took over a lot, Carly, I'll be honest. And in fact, like it's not until recently that I feel more like myself than I ever have. Um, but I took it every day, every, every, every step of time, right? Like I know that sounds trite, but there's this concept of interval thinking, right? That we talk to our members about a lot of just like, you know, for example, someone gets pregnant and they're obviously super fearful. They might have another miscarriage, which is what happened with me, right? I was pregnant. I had lost the baby. I was terrified. And so like a mantra we have for our members is like, today I'm pregnant, right? Like, and that's all I know. And I'm going to go through that. And we're going to see what tomorrow brings. Um, and I think, you know, leaning on people for me was key and was really hard because what I found was I was this sandwiched in. I had at 30, I had moved cross country and gotten a divorce. So I had a whole set of New York friends who I either grew up with or went to college with, who had multiple children or were pregnant. Uh, and then I had a whole set of San Francisco friends who were single. And so I was like, well, no one gets it, right? Um, yeah. But talking about it was sort of my antidote to that. And I talked about getting divorced at 30 a lot and turned out nobody was getting divorced that I knew, but people had similar experiences to me and that really connected me and made me feel validated. And it wasn't as similar to this where I started talking about this and little did I know, but people who had kids had gone through it and they had friends who were going through it currently. And so it became this like web of this underground network um, that is what got me through, right? That. And I think yeah. I didn't have what I've now created with Conceive. And so I think every day I get so inspired to make sure that I can solve for some of these key problems. But I think it was, you know, also therapy, played a role in getting through it, right? I found a great therapist when I moved back to New York. Um, and creating like, uh, creating that, like that, that group of people was, was so critical for me. I, I love that. And a couple things. So even when you said, you know, you're going through that hard time and it reminded me so much, I don't know if you've listened to Jay Shetty or you listened to his podcast, but he said something where, it's so valuable to ask someone who's in need if they want to be heard, helped, or hugged. Yes. And and it's literally falling into one of those categories, I guess Jay right? And, and I it's are saying you alike. Know, <laughs> it's totally. You guys are completely aligned. But it's really it. that concept of, you know, do you are you looking for a solution or you just need some support and someone to hug you? So I really love that. And then I find it actually so powerful and exciting about, you know you actually, how you got to Weight Watchers, but the power of community that you learned from that, that you then took with you to conceive, which is amazing. And so tell me a little bit now as a founder, right? And as a solo founder and as a female solo founder, like all of these little things that, you know, from the outside can be seen weighed against you in this world. How has that process been for you? And almost what has been the most challenging or surprising thing that you think you only knew once you went full force into this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Challenging, surprising, scary. Okay. Those are all true yeah. <laughs> ways to describe it. <laughs> right. I, I have to say that the challenges are different when you're so kind of certain on solving a problem that needs to be solved. I know that sounds maybe annoying for people to hear, but that to me is what is so true that like, there is nothing that will stop me from solving this problem, right? And I think that my my having lived it is one thing, right? Is a, is a key thing, but also me validating it with hundreds of other people and seeing it every single day is another thing. And so, like the the ability, my ability to understand and you know have empathy and compassion for this group of people. Like I will run through any wall <laughs> and I will, I will figure anything out because I'm just convinced that we can solve these problems. Like I just, there's nothing I doubt about that. And so from that perspective, like 
like believing in myself and believing in this problem space, like I don't feel challenges the way I have before. It's a weird thing to say, but like um, there is something beautiful in being able to control your own destiny. And I know that comes from privilege, right? You know, I worked a shit ton to get to a place where I could start my own company and not really make an income anymore. Um, And there's something scary about that, but there is like nothing I... I was called to do this. It sounds again, I'm not yeah. really a spiritual person, but this podcast is bringing up all kinds of spirituality in me. Like this is my meaning on earth and there's nothing that gives me more joy. So I think from a challenge perspective, I don't see it as challenging. I just see it as like, we can figure it out. Like we can solve this. It was yeah. sort of solved in the weight loss space. It can be solved in the fertility space. And there's a lot of changes that we need to instrument, which you know comes from education and talking about these problems and then comes from us actually solving them. Um, scary. Of course it's scary. Um, but again, I think my conviction just overrode any kind of fear that I had in doing it. Um, and I think, you know, like the, the challenge of being a solo founder is, you know, has its blessings and its curses. Um, I think I hired an incredible team. Um, I love my team. I am just like, in awe of them every day, uh, that I think really rounds out my skill sets in a like beautiful way. And, um, and so it allows me, it allows us to really like, yeah, grow in a way that, um, is incredible, but I lean on them for many things that, you know, I think if there was a larger founding team, I would as well. Um, I think for me, I just couldn't wait to start the company. I knew I needed to solve the problems now. And I think I didn't have the, like, the luxury of spending a year getting to know somebody and seeing if they were the right fit. Um, So it was this just natural progression of me kind of doing it solo, but I don't think of it that way because I I have such a strong team. Yeah. And Lauren, I think it's funny because you, you talk about it as if, like you said, you think it's obvious, but weirdly enough, it's not obvious, you know, and there are so many founders who actually don't start a company because it's a calling. Yeah. And I think truly that, you know, the challenges that they face are real challenges because they don't have that inner motivation to say, you know what, I'm not going to run through walls to solve this or I'm going to try, but it's going to be really freaking hard. You know, whereas I think there's such a stark difference for the founders that have that true, again, authenticity and that calling where they're like, you know what, screw anything that comes in my way. I, I'm going to get there. So I, I really, I love that. And I'm so happy you, you said that. Cause I think it, I think it's almost a testament to the founder that you are and the, and the company that you are building, which is amazing. So Lauren, I want to know what is your superpower? My superpower is connecting with people and really building communities. That's something I've just, as we've, yeah. as we've discussed it's been something just so innate in me. And I think it was a lot of me looking outward to find connection and find kind of purpose. I find a lot of purpose and connection and meaning through love and through other people. And so that's always been the thing that's driven me and the thing that I've excelled at. And I think what's been beautiful is trying to like, you know, go into Weight Watchers and learning to kind of bring that did to the digital world, especially when the pandemic hit and there was not going to be a such thing as sort of an in-person kind of, um, ecosystem for this. So yeah, that's me. That's great. I think it's very clear, you know, just from this, just from talking to you here, but Lauren, another, another question I would love to know is what is a book that you think everyone has to read, or at least it's changed some type of outlook in your life? I have two, um, if I may. Uh, so one of the books that changed my life, the courage to be disliked. I'm even I'm butchering the title. Have you read it? I haven't, but just by the title, I'm I'm excited by it. But yeah, it is it's a very unique book. I mean, it was originally written in Japanese, so you know, translated, and it's a whole philosophy um, of exactly what it sounds like, right? How like life is not about being liked by other people, which I think is actually a pretty radical idea for most girls especially of my generation, uh, right? We were all taught to people please and be likable. And now I don't think the notion is, right, 
that we have to go the opposite way of what the sort of meta analyses say of not using language that's tentative to bring people in. But I also think it's really about and here's here's a great example, actually. My my friend Lauren Mackler, who runs Co-Fertility, which is a company I invested in, um, and she's become a dear friend and a, a great founder friend. She said something the other day that really resonated with me, which which was rejection is protection. And I thought that was such a beautiful thing um, and concept, which is sort of what this book is about, is that like not everyone's going to like you. Right. And it's usually not about you, by the way, which we all kind of conceptually know, but we sometimes internalize these things. Um, what's important to you is really finding your passions, pursuing those passions, treating people with respect and love. Right. Of course, along the way, um, but also dismissing things that aren't working for you. It's OK to like move past something if it's not working and it's better to do that than to get stuck. So that book has been really transformational. It's the kind of thing I go back to regularly to like remind myself because I am, I am shedding this notion of being a people pleaser. It's like, you know, and, and, and being a perfectionist, which were things that I was raised to sort of be. The second book is Setting the Table by Danny Meyer. Danny um, is a huge inspiration and muse for me. I think a lot of people has re have read his book. Obviously, he's this incredible restaurateur um, who's built some of the like pillars of the restaurant industry, everything from Eleven Madison Park and Gramercy Tavern to Shake Shack and Union Square Cafe and everything in between. But his concept of he has so many concepts in the book, and I, I've gotten the privilege of speaking with him um, about all the things that resonated with me. But there are so many concepts in the book that are inspiration for how we built Conceive from the start. And his philosophy around enlightened hospitality um, is something that we infuse into every communication, every design element. And the idea is really just like simply, how do you make someone feel like they just got a hug? How do you leave them better off than when you found them? And if you can do that in healthcare, right, I think you change the world, right? Like if you can just uh, nurture someone in a way that they haven't been seen and heard, we can change everything. I'm convinced you can change outcomes just by that feeling of support, right? And that's really the North Star for us. Um, he also has this notion of the excellence reflex, which is like, you know, people who inherently see something and need to fix it. Now, that doesn't mean we have a team of perfectionists because you can't really be, thrive at a startup and be a perfectionist. But it's just people who innately know when something is amiss and they're going to fix it, even if it's not in their job description to do. Right. Um, so there's so much to take away from that book. And I, I we we sent it out to our entire team. I love that. And there are so many things, even from even from the concept where you can take a whole different industry, right? And pull things into, you know, the industry that you're in. And it actually applies in so many ways. So I love that. I actually listened to Danny talk at a pod, uh, on a podcast about what you yeah. just mentioned, like his different tenets of leadership and what he almost implements with Shake Shack specifically. Yes. And it's great. It's amazing. And then even the courage to be disliked, I think it's such a fascinating topic. You, you, you touched on all the important points about being a woman. And I actually spoke very recently on another episode with Sarah Bakepore about what it means to be disagreeable as a leader yeah. and how it's almost like disagreeableness versus asshole. And there's actually, a, you know, it's not, it's a difference. Yeah. So I love all of that. Yeah. I think it's super fascinating. Anyway, Lauren, it has been such a pleasure having you on the podcast. Thank you so much for coming. It's been great. Carly, this was so much fun. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to the show this week. If you enjoyed, please spread the word. Tell someone about She Leads or post about it on social media and tag us. If you want to contact us, feel free to send over a message through the She Leads Instagram page at sheleads.show. If you want to follow us on Twitter, our account is at sheleadsshow and mine is at Carly Malatsky. This episode was produced and edited by Nick Fershow. Thank you also to our partner, Floodgate. If you're passionate about startups and want to learn more about the starting journey of those who have built groundbreaking companies, I highly recommend listening to Starting Greatness with Mike Maples Jr., the founding partner of Floodgate. He has an incredible show that, in my opinion, is definitely worth your time. Thanks again.